In 1965, the engineer and co-founder of the company Intel, Gordon Moore, made a prediction in an interview for an electronics magazine. The prediction made by Moore went down in history and became known as Moore's Law. He said that the size of transistors in computers should decrease by approximately half each year. Transistors are the most essential part of modern computers, so what Moore's Law says is that computers should double their computational capacity every year. And for a guess made without much thought during a casual interview, Moore's Law is eerily accurate. Since 1970, the size of transistors has halved every two years. Moore got his prediction right. The pace and practice was only slightly different. The points on this graph represent the size of microchips between 1970 and 2010, with the dotted line being the prediction made by Moore's Law. And the trend is very clear. Moore correctly predicted the evolution of computational power. But even though it is accurate, Moore's Law is not a law of nature. It is a very well-made guess about the future of the computer industry. But not everything good can last forever. Hey, Pedro here. This video you are watching was originally in Portuguese, my native language. This is the attempt of our team to translate it to English, and I sincerely hope you enjoy it. Your feedback is extremely important to us. Now, back to the video. Transistors are physical, solid material components, and like everything material, they are also made of atoms. We are reaching the size limit for these transistors. The first transistor could fit in the palm of your hand, and today 50 billion of them can fit on the area of your fingernail. Nowadays, the size of transistors is already measured in atoms, on the nanometer scale. But you can't make a transistor with just one atom. We are reaching the minimum size for transistor design, the point where Moore's law will run into the laws of physics. In other words, it is becoming increasingly difficult to have the size of a transistor. And soon it will be impossible. We are living at the end of Moore's law, at least for traditional computers with electronic transistors. And will we then be doomed to not have better and faster computers? There are other possibilities to improve computers. For example, light-based computers. Yes, using light, like the screen of your cell phone or a laser. This is the idea behind optical computing, which aims to advance human computational power by using light instead of electricity. In fact, optical computing already has a successful example, which is the internet, or part of it. It is a thousand times more efficient to transmit information via light signals than using electricity. And for this reason, a large part of the internet infrastructure is based on optical fibers using light signals instead of electrical wires. To be clear, optical computers are not made of optical fiber, but they would have the same advantage that optical fibers have in terms of moving large volumes of information. So, how do light-based computers work? And can they help with the end of Moore's law? Before getting into the details of optical computing, I need to address something that might be on some of your minds. There is another way to double computational power besides using smaller transistors, which is to make larger computers. So, do we really need an alternative to electronic computers? Can't we just make bigger computers? Yes, making larger computers is part of the advancement of computing, especially industrial computing, such as supercomputers from companies like OpenAI and Google. They use enormous amounts of processing power for all kinds of tasks. And the task that is receiving the most attention at the moment is training artificial intelligences through machine learning. The problem is that training AIs on the scale of a GPT model requires a lot of computational power, which consumes a lot of energy. And although it is indeed possible to make larger computers, electronic computers are not that efficient. Computer chips use electricity running through conductors, but this process generates heat. And a good portion of the energy in computers is wasted as heat. Therefore, electronic computers need to be actively cooled when they are operating. Increasing the capacity of artificial intelligence means exponentially increasing the available computational power and the amount of available data, which costs energy. And it costs energy inefficiently due to the production of heat. There is room for alternatives to electronic computers at the scale of supercomputers. And this is where optical computers come in, which do not produce heat like electrical currents do, and they might come with some other advantages as well. Optical computers experienced a surge of interest in the 1990s, and research on them was particularly related to artificial intelligences. For example, this 1993 article shows how a group of researchers used an optical computer to create a facial recognition artificial intelligence. In 1993, which for some people feels like 10 years ago, but in reality it's more than 30 years ago. The group did not use optical computers by chance. Optical computers are good at multiplying matrices. 
Matrices are basically tables of numbers that follow a specific rule of multiplication. The details of how to multiply matrices do not matter. What matters is that matrices are very useful in various areas of computing, ranging from image processing to part of the training of artificial intelligences. Two components that a facial recognition AI needs. Improving the ability to multiply matrices enhances all human computational power. And optical computers are excellent at multiplying matrices, even better than traditional computers. But why are light-based computers so good with matrices? To explain this, I need to go into the details of how a light-based computer works. And as a point of comparison, I need to explain how the electronic transistors of traditional computers work. In the most concise way possible, a transistor is a device that controls the flow of an electric current based on a second electric charge. In other words, an electric current can only pass through a transistor if the transistor is powered by a second external current, called the control current. Basically, an electricity valve controlled by electricity. The electric current passing through a transistor can be associated with a bit of information, a value that can be 1 or 0. Computing involves manipulating these 1s and zeros associated with currents passing through transistors. And this is done by controlling the state of one transistor with another transistor. In other words, the electric current that determines the value of a transistor is determined by a second transistor, which can also be zero or one, and which in turn can be controlled by a third transistor, and so on. By organizing them in the right way, it is possible to create an electrical circuit that performs logical and mathematical operations, which is the foundation of a computer. And it is possible to do basically the same thing with light, there is still no standard model of a light-based computer as there is for electronic computers. There are various ways to associate properties of light with the values 1 and 0, and then manipulate these values with an optical analog of transistors. For example, some optical crystals allow or block the passage of light of a specific color based on how they are illuminated by another light source. In other words, there are crystals that basically act like transistors, but for light. And it is possible to use these crystals to control the flow of light in the same way that computers control the flow of electrical currents. And this is where there is a trap in optical computers. If you try to use these optical crystals as transistors and mimic the design of a traditional computer, your optical computer will not perform well. Electronic computers were developed with the advantages of electricity in mind. Light is not electricity. We need to take into account the unique properties of light to create truly useful designs for optical computers. For example, one of the main difficulties of computers is that the wires connecting the different transistors and computer chips can never cross. If two wires touch, the electrical currents in both will mix, causing either a computational error or a short circuit. So, one must be very careful and make good use of the three dimensions of space to create computer boards. This imposes certain limits on the design of how electronic computers will be built. And the same is not true for light rays. Two light rays can cross without interfering with each other. Therefore, preventing light beams from crossing is not a concern for optical computers. Light rays can also be split and recombined. It is even possible to change the trajectory of light rays dynamically during a process in an optical computer, which is something impossible in a conductive wire. And it is precisely by using these unique properties of light in designs specifically conceived for light that it is possible to create optical computers that are better than electronic computers. At least in some tasks, such as matrix multiplication and certain types of minimization problems. What I need to make clear are two very important things in computing. Optical computers are unlikely to replace electronic computers for general tasks, but they can indeed replace certain functions of classical computers, especially when the problem requires a powerful supercomputer because light-based computers are more efficient and produce very little residual heat. Moreover, optical computers seem particularly well-suited for various types of machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms, which is an extremely important area of modern computing. If someone creates a truly efficient and practically useful optical computer, that computer will be used. So why are we not using optical computers yet? Excluding those gaming computers full of RGB lights. Optical computers are a new technology that has only recently regained significant attention with the surge of interest in artificial intelligence. However, there are still many limitations on the path to practical optical computing. For example, it is still relatively slow to convert electronic information into optical information. Therefore, it is difficult for electronic computers and optical computers to communicate with each other. In fact, the existing models of optical computers already use one-third of their energy on the problem of conversion between light and electricity. Another issue is that the concept is still new. So, we are not sure what the best designs for light-based computers are, and there are still not many algorithms ready to solve the problems that optical computers are supposed to be good at solving. 
It takes time and testing to build the kind of convenience that electronic computers have had for decades, such as a consistent design that can be produced at scale, and a library of ready-to-use algorithms for optical computers. Currently, the best optical computers are still 300 times worse than equivalent electronic computers. This seems like a lot, but it isn't when we remember Moore's law. Being a novelty is a disadvantage, but it is also an opportunity. While traditional computers have reached the point where they have to struggle with the laws of physics to improve, optical computers are a novelty with plenty of room to grow. If something like Moore's law applies to optical computers, they should start to evolve faster than modern electronic computers. If the capacity of optical computers doubles like the capacity of electronic computers has doubled, optical computers should become a viable and useful technology by 2040, in 30 years from now. Just kidding, 2040 is much closer than that. Thank you very much and see you next time.